As was the case in 1958, the first feature recorded by the railway roundabout team in 1959 was the closure of a group of railway lines, this time those emanating from Monmouth to both Ross-on-Wye and Chepstow. The first location visited was Ross-on-Wye, where the Monmouth auto train left from the bay platform. Pat Whitehouse and John Adams didn't attend on the last day of all, on which only an enthusiast special ran, but the day before, when the last normal service trains ran. This enabled them to record a number of trains, and of course to ride in the driver's compartment of one of the auto trailers along the Wye Valley and through Simmons Yacht Station. Today, much of the course of this line has been obliterated by the M50 motorway, for although it had many scenic attractions, the Wye Valley didn't attract many tourists and had few centres of population. The railway was losing £10,000 a year, and even the local bus services couldn't be made to pay. Monmouth was approached via a Gerda bridge over the River Wye, which turned to the south here towards Chepstow. Monmouth had two stations, the original Monmouth, May Hill, on the far side of the bridge, and Monmouth Troy, which was the junction for the other Wye Valley line to Chepstow. The standard locomotives on the Wye Valley lines were the Collet 1400 auto tanks and the familiar pannier tanks on the Chepstow line. Railway enthusiasts made up the majority of the passengers on this last weekend. Overnight snow was to present a different scene for the final day. On the Gloucester to South Wales main line, Chepstow was the junction station for the 13 and three quarter mile branch to Monmouth, following the meandering Wye Valley. Originally, there'd been only four intermediate stations, but an effort to increase custom by the sighting of six additional halts could not stem the tide of passengers deserting the railway. Redbrook was the last station before Monmouth and only had good sidings with no passing facilities. The line crossed and recrossed the River Wye and was consequently expensive to maintain. It was reported that this branch was losing £13,000 a year on passenger services alone, but it was to survive for a further five years for freight use only and a small portion of the Chepstow end is still in use today, running to the stone quarry at Tidenham. Monmouth Troy had once been a through station, but the line through the tunnel to Pontypool Road had seen its last passenger services in May 1955. The pannier tank wasn't auto-fitted, so it had to run round. On this last day, all trains were specially strengthened, a single auto-coach usually having sufficed. As the evening drew in, the last trains were prepared at Monmouth. The first of these to go was to Chepstow. Once the pannier had left, the 1400 tank was able to run round 
as its four-coach last train wasn't auto-fitted. Sadly, its departure couldn't be filmed as the light had gone. A relic of the Victorian era was the next target for Pat Whitehouse. The 2 4 wheel arrangement was effectively obsolete by the 1890s. But the Great Eastern Railway produced what was to become the last surviving type of this wheel arrangement in the 1890s. Known as intermediates, they were classified as E4 by the London and North Eastern Railway. Originally, there were a hundred in the class, but by 1959, only this one survived in use as Cambridge's pilot. It had become something of a pet and was looked after by its crews with its bright work polished. The Cambridge University Railway Club had often hired it at weekends for use on the Milton Hall branch. The letters RA2 under its number signified that it had route availability number two, which meant it could go on almost any lines. Eighty-two of the engines had gone for scrap as long ago as 1940, but the 18 survivors remained intact until 1954, their light weight making them useful on many secondary routes, some of them migrating northwards from their familiar East Anglian territory. This engine, as the final survivor, was retained for preservation and today is part of the National Collection, restored to its original Great Eastern Royal Blue livery as number 490, but sadly not in working condition. The railway roundabout duo of Pat Whitehouse and John Adams were natives of the Birmingham area and consequently they were well placed to film a special train organised by the local area group of the Stevenson Locomotive Society which was to visit a number of lines in the Birmingham suburbs. The train was headed by one of the Midland Railway Class 2F 060 tender engines and the SLS's well-known Midlands Area Secretary W.A. Cam Canwell is seen affixing the headboard and talking to the Birmingham New Street station master before the train set out past a jubilee. A second 2F brought up the rear of the train as the first destination was the Harborn branch, just a few miles to the west of New Street, which boasted a 1 in 66 gradient. The line had been conceived as a through route to the Helzoen branch at Lapple, but had been built as a three and a half mile suburban branch. It had remained independent until 1922, although worked by the London and Northwestern Railway from the start, and had been highly successful. It was the best paying suburban branch by far and before the First World War had 27 trains each way daily. However, it was an early victim of bus competition and lost its passenger services during the economic depression of the 1930s on the 26th of November 1934. In those days railways still carried a large proportion of freight traffic and the little branch survived on this business until November 1963, a further 29 years. One of the factories served by the branch was the Chad Valley Toy Company, where they made Great Western jigsaw puzzles, amongst other things. Birmingham was served by three main railways, the London North Western, the Midland and the Great Western. The latter's route to the South West was joined to the North Western at Smethwick West Junction. The Great Western lines are in the foreground, to the left leading to Handsworth and Birmingham Snow Hill, 
whilst the line in the background up which the SLS special is proceeding was the connecting spur to the LNWR from New Street. This line remains in use today for services to Starbridge, Kidderminster and Worcester. Zone was an important black country town which owed its growth to the Industrial Revolution. Unfortunately, it had been bypassed by the line to Star Bridge and had consequently been served only by a single line branch that ran between Old Hill on the Star Bridge line and the Midland Railway main line at Northfield, six miles to the north of Bromsgrove, to which a further line had been projected from Hales Owen but never built. The station at Hales Owen was at the foot of banks in both directions the severe gradients necessitating banking engines. A third Midland 2F was provided to bank the special, which had arrived from the Old Hill direction. Hale's own station had not seen timetable public trains since 1927, when trains from Old Hill had ceased. The line from Hale's own itself to the Midland main line was jointly owned by the Great Western and the Midland Railway, and had lost its passenger services as long ago as 1919, although the stations remained in good condition. This was because for nearly 40 years, unadvertised workmen's trains continued to run, being provided by the Great Western from Old Hill to Longbridge, just short of the Midland Main Line, where the Austin Car Company had their works. These had been withdrawn in September 1958, but the line continued to carry freight traffic until 1964. The first crossing loop on the line was at Huntington, where Bluebird toffees are made. This is set at the top of the bank from Hales Owen, and the banker was detached here. Finally, we see the special running through the complex of lines at the Longbridge Works. Three shunting engines were kept here in the shed on the right. The next station on the Midland Main Line was Barnt Green, a junction for the cross-country branch line that served the important Worcestershire town of Redditch and bypassed the Licky Incline to give a through route to Cheltenham and Gloucester via Evesham and Ashchurch. Coming off the main line at Barnt Green is a train from Birmingham New Street, headed by one of the famous Fowler compounds. This engine had been especially rostered for the cameras in order to make this film for Railway Roundabout. This shows how the railways cooperated with Pat Whitehouse and John Adams. By this time, Railway Roundabout had established itself on television and British Railways management was realising the publicity value of a TV programme, aimed as it was at both boys and adults. The live commentary given by Pat and John was tailored to have an educational benefit and scenes were shot to illustrate various points, such as these of watering and handing over the token at Redditch. The railway was single line beyond the town and only the driver in possession of the token was allowed to run his train over the stretch to which the token referred. This was and remains the standard practice for working single line railways. Although today the tokens are electronic signals rather than physical pieces of metal. The tokens were exchanged manually either when the train was stopped in a station or if not travelling too quickly on the move. The token was put in a pouch attached to a large hoop which then could be slipped over the engineman's arm. Each section of the railway between signal boxes would have a token or staff inscribed with the names of the section to which it applied. Various methods were adopted to synchronise the tokens with signalling and point work, but the most common took the form of a key, which could be inserted in a mechanical apparatus to unlock the appropriate levers to enable the train to proceed. The system in use here was known as token full block. The locomotive, number 41157, built in 1925 by the North British Locomotive Company of Glasgow, was cleaned up for its television stardom and worked the train for two days for the cameras. As mentioned earlier, it was built to the design of Sir Henry Fowler, the second LMS chief mechanical engineer, and the design was a development of Johnson & Dealey's Midland compound, first produced in the early 1900s. The onboard camera was in use on one run and captured the arrival at Broome Junction, 
a small country junction station where the former Stratford-upon-Avon and Midland Junction Railway came in from the east. This line had a colourful history, but the section from Stratford to Broome Junction was to close in 1960. It had lost its passenger services in 1947. The SMJ is seen disappearing behind the compound. Salford Priors was the next station after Broome Junction. Here Pat saw some road rollers rusting quietly away. Today they would attract as much attention as a locomotive. These engines were the first LMS Express passenger engines and were soon hopelessly underpowered for the increasingly heavy mainline trains. They did much good work in Scotland and on former Midland lines, but were soon relegated to secondary work as the LMS caught up with modern Pacific and 460 designs for the principal duties. This cross-country line was usually worked by Fowler's large 264 tank engines, which had the same boiler as the compounds. At Evesham, the Great Western's Cotswold line to Worcester, known as the Old Worse and Worse, at its own station to the right of our train. The line had been transferred to the western region upon nationalisation and beyond Evesham was double track. A junction had been put in at Evesham to allow the route to be used as a diversionary line for Cheltenham to Honeybourne trains. The line was known as the Loop and rejoined the Midland main line at Ashchurch. It was used as an alternative route for freight trains avoiding the Licky incline but was never engineered to express standards becoming redundant in the 1960s as it duplicated both the Midland Main Line and the Great Western one via Honeybourne, the latter also being axed by Dr. Beachy. It closed to passengers in 1963, with freight finishing in the following year. Whilst number 41157 was destined for the scrap heap in 1960, the first of the line, number 41000, was destined to live on. Here we see her in her final British Railways guise at Crew Works before being taken to Derby for a complete overhaul and restoration. Here she was subjected to an effective rebuild rather than simple overhaul. It was not the first time she'd been rebuilt. The history of the Midland compounds is long and complicated. The Midland Railway's philosophy throughout its existence had been to run light, frequent trains and to this end built a large number of moderately dimensioned locomotives for both passenger and freight use. This was carried through when heavier trains were acquired, the policy being simply to double-head these, a practice which other railways tried to avoid due to the staffing costs. Throughout the Victorian era, the Midland flew in the phase of orthodoxy reintroducing single driving wheeled express engines in the 1890s when other railways were using 440s and introducing very small 440s in the early part of the 20th century when others were building 460s. However, there was a need for more powerful locomotives but in Midland tradition this need was met by increasing the power of the 440s rather than opting for larger engines. There was a practical side to this as larger locomotives would be longer and necessitate changes to the railway infrastructure, notably in the provision of bigger turntables. The railway's chief mechanical engineer, Samuel Johnson, turned to the principle of compounding to get more power from his locomotives. In this, steam is used twice before exhausting to the atmosphere, at first in conventional small high-pressure cylinders and then in larger diameter low-pressure cylinders. The system had been in use in Great Britain with varying degrees of success notably by the web compounds of the London and North Western Railway, unsuccessfully, and didn't have a good reputation. Johnson's design was without doubt the most successful in Great Britain, and the first locomotive, number 2631, was built in 1901. The design was subsequently improved by his successor, Dealey, who added 40 to Johnson's total of just five. 2631 was renumbered 1000 in 1907, and between 1914 and 1919, the original five Johnson engines were rebuilt to conform with the Dealey locomotives that were also being rebuilt with superheaters at that time. Thereafter, all the engines were effectively one class, and the magnificent number 1000 
which emerged from Derby Works in 1959, was representative of the final Midland Railway Express locomotive design, rather than an original Johnson engine. Number 1000 had been preserved as part of the British Transport Commission's collection, which was then housed at Clapham Museum in London. There was a movement at the time to preserve locomotives as working examples, which had been started in 1957, when the Great Western City-class engine, City of Truro, had been returned to steam after nearly 25 years as a static museum piece. It's interesting to note that while number 1000 in its original guise had been built in 1901, the Great Western engine was two years its junior, but the Midland engine went directly from service to a working retirement. Official photographs were taken at Worksworth, the traditional place for Midland Railway photography. This second photographic session took place in front of the local school children, many of whom it was hoped would be railway roundabout viewers. The engine had been taken back to Derby to be turned to allow pictures of both sides. She was finished in the full glory of the Midlands Crimson Lake livery, with that railway's heraldic achievement on the cab sides, topped by the famous Wyvern. Indeed, she was to rise like another mythical bird, the Phoenix, when she returned to steam inside Derby's roundhouse, preparatory to her first trial run from Derby to Leicester. These film shots were taken at slow speed as the light was very low inside the roundhouse. The trial run started from Derby Station. The man on the right is John Scholes, the first curator of the Clapper Museum for the British Transport Commission. The restoration of number 1000 was very much his project, and he was extremely particular in ensuring the magnificent finish was not harmed. The engine was cold by hand and banned from passing under a coaling chute. Pat Whitehouse had the full cooperation of Derby on this trial run and rode in the first coach. Leaning out of the window, he recalls that three people held his legs for these shots. The outward trial finished at Leicester Midland Station. The locomotive was then turned and ran back to Derby, where it was, of course, originally built and rebuilt. The first notable rail tour was run to celebrate the Golden Jubilee of the Stevenson Locomotive Society, or SLS, which was founded in 1909, and the tour started at Birmingham New Street from the Midlands number no. 4 platform. The train ran north via Derby Midland, where it paused for photographs, and then carried on to the north via Ambergate, Clay Cross and Sheffield Midland Station, another photocall. The train's destination was York, where the locomotive was eventually to be housed at the National Railway Museum, which became the successor to Clapham. She was destined for a further spell of mainline working in the early 1980s, but is now retired again alongside the pride of York, the famous Mallard, which was still a mainline locomotive in 1959. Number 1000's mentor, John Scholes, was instrumental in drawing up the famous British Railways list of historical locomotives for eventual preservation 
which of course included both number 1000 and Mallard. Today that list forms the backbone of the collection of the National Railway Museum at York, where these locomotives are preserved for the benefit of the nation, along with the railway roundabout films themselves from which this series of programmes has been prepared. Scottish locomotives enjoyed their own preservation programme, which is based on Glasgow Transport Museum. In the late 1950s, a number of historical Scottish locomotives were preserved in working order and were used for a series of trains in connection with the 1959 Scottish Industries Exhibition held alongside Kelvin Hall Station on the northwest side of Glasgow city centre. The first of the quartet of Scottish engines is the Caledonian Single, which is followed by the Great North of Scotland Railway 440 Gordon Highlander. A Stanier Coronation Pacific stands by at Glasgow Central as two other historic locomotives reverse out of the Caledonian's terminus. The Scottish Quartet had been augmented by the great western city of Truro, making its furthest ever trip north, and a highly unusual pairing with the third Scottish locomotive, the North British 440 Glen Douglas. Glen Douglas was to spend more than 26 years in Glasgow Transport Museum after retirement in 1965, and was presented to Glasgow Corporation in 1966. In 1992, it was brought out again to be prepared for a further period of mainline running. City of Truro also enjoyed another period of mainline use from 1985 to 1992, and has been preserved as part of the national collection of the National Railway Museum at York. This historic locomotive had been credited with the first recorded speed in excess of 100 miles an hour on a run in April 1904. Perhaps one of the most elegant 440 designs of all was the Great North of Scotland Railway's Class F. One example was preserved as GNOS's number 49 Gordon Highlander. The engine had been repainted in July 1958 after withdrawal from operating stock and for the next seven years worked special trains in the company of the other Scottish preserved engines, which were all shedded at the ex-Caledonian railway shed at Dornzone. The Caledonian single number 123 was a unique machine. It was obsolete before it was built, but was a one-off exhibition machine built in 1886 by the Glasgow firm of Nielsen and Company for an exhibition in the city at which it won a gold medal. It was based on the design of the then current Caledonian 440s altered to have just a single driving axle. After the exhibition it was sold to the Caledonian Railway and achieved further fame in the railway races to the north in 1888. It was withdrawn in 1935, but retained as it was the last single driver in service. It was returned to working order in the year of this film, 1959, and this was one of its first appearances. The final Scottish historical locomotive was the Highland Railway 460, or Jones Goods. This was the first 460 design in Great Britain, and acquired its sobriquet after its designer's name. It was the first of a series of 15 engines numbered from 103 to 117 for the Highland, which later became part of the LMS. That railway withdrew the class between 1929 and 1940, but preserved this engine in view of its historical importance. It was originally painted in Highland Railway Green, but when returned to traffic in 1959, it appeared in Stroudley Yellow, a colour it sported for a short while after it was built. This exhibition was one of its earliest appearances after its return to use. It retired once again in 1965 and has not yet returned to work. One of Scotland's most famous routes is that from Fort William to Malague in the Western Highlands. It was comparatively recently built, opening in the early part of this century and it opened up one of the most beautiful parts of the country to tourists. 
In the shadow of Ben Nevis, trains set off over the original West Highland line as far as Maleg Junction, where they turned northeastwards towards Benavi, where the railway crossed the Caledonian Canal, which connected Fort William to Inverness. The line to our left is a goods loop, serving an industrial siding near Corpac. The line rang alongside Loch Isle as it headed into the mountains. After leaving the Loch side, the line begins to climb towards Glenfinnan on gradients of between 1 in 50 and 1 in 60. The line twists and turns as it approaches the famous concrete viaduct at Glenfinnan, with numerous speed restrictions. Pat and John travelled on the train and by road to obtain these views, as part of their visit to the West Highlands when they were filming a pair of Glen 440s on the main line from Fort William to Glasgow in May 1959. Glenfinnan viaduct is famous for being the first use of concrete in such a structure, built by Concrete Bob McAlpine. Note the fish fans at the back of the train. Glenfinnan was the first stop for this train. Here the train is approaching the top of the climb after Glenfinnan, the last part being 1 in 70. Lochalot was passed non-stop. The second important passing station is at Arisaig, after which the famous White Sands can be seen as the train turns to the north alongside the Atlantic Ocean. Maleg is famous for its kippers, and fishing has always been its principal trade. The station is set alongside the small harbour where the hardy fishing fleet was moored. At this time, rail tracks led along the harbour's jetty, and fish traffic was an important source of revenue for the railway. Fish fans often ran in passenger trains, but always at the back. Maleg's other seafaring business was the ferry trade to the Isle of Skye, operated by McBrain's shipping company something of a Scottish institution. At the station, two of Sir Nigel Gresley's Class K2 moguls, a type for long associated with the West Highland, stood ready to run back to Fort William, the engine on the left heading a fish train. This is a railway that still sees steam in the summer, as British Rail runs a regular steam hauled train during the season from Fort William to Malay.
Perhaps the most famous electric train of all was the Brighton Bell, the Southern Railway and later Southern Regions, all Pullman electric multiple unit train, which ran from London Victoria Station to Brighton. There were three five-car units for the Brighton Bell service, numbers 3051, 2 and 3. The Pullman Car Company's British workshops were at Brighton, so they were able to keep a watchful eye on them. The mechanical side of the trains were the responsibility of the Southern, whilst the passenger accommodation was Pullman's. The units were painted in the standard Pullman livery of chocolate and cream, elaborately lined out. First-class cars bore female names, whilst third and later second-class cars merely bore numbers. The Brighton Bell units were of both classes, the driving cars at each end being second class. The Pullman Car Company's income came from the supplementary fares charged, and for this the traveller was entitled to a reserved seat, service from uniformed attendants, and an at-the-seat meal service at all times. The train attracted a regular clientele, who became very attached to its old-world charm, based on Edwardian standards of travel, a jewel amongst the standardised electric trains that shared the Brighton route. The railway roundabout camera crew went to Brighton Station in 1959 to film the train at the height of its popularity. It had commenced running on the 1st of January 1933 as the Southern Bell, but the name was changed to Brighton Bell 18 months later. It continued to run until the 30th of April 1972, the only break being during the Second World War. The normal formation was 10 cars, the third unit being kept as standby. This also allowed the train to operate as normal when any one of the units was undergoing overhaul. Some off-peak services were formed of one unit only. They never ran any scheduled services other than the Brighton one throughout their careers, although they were occasionally used to form specials. Arrival at London Victoria was within an hour of leaving Brighton. Two up and two down trains were run daily. All 15 Brighton Bell Pullman cars exist today. Some of them still work regularly out of Victoria Station in the British formation of the Venice Sampler Orient Express. Others are used as restaurants or as coaching stock on preserved railways. Many of the boys who watched Railway Roundabout were avid train spotters, or rather loco spotters, as their principal interest was in the steam locomotive, and collecting the numbers by recording them in the famous Ian Allen ABC Loco Spotters books was a huge hobby. The Ian Allen Loco Spotters Club was founded in the 1940s and had grown into a sizable organisation by the 1950s. Many members harboured the ambition to become a driver. The club organised a number of rail tours over unusual routes or with unusual or special motive power and held club meetings. However, the ultimate thrill for the young loco spotter was a shed bash. Again, these were organised by the club, but many a railway enthusiast of today can recall the back ways in through broken fences and perhaps the tip of the shed foreman's boot as they left the premises rapido. By dint of their good connections with British railways, Patrick Whitehouse and John Adams were able to arrange shed visits on an official basis and were able to bring the near legendary sheds to all the loco spotters in the country through the television medium. The ultimate legend of all, number 60022 Mallard, the fastest steam locomotive ever, was the first to be seen when the cameras were taken to King's Cross Shed in London. This was the principal metropolitan shed for the eastern region and its forebears, the London and North Eastern Railway and Great Northern Railway and it was always known colloquially as Top Shed.
Note the corridor connection on the back of the tender. This was provided to allow a change of engine crew on the move on non-stop expresses to Newcastle and Edinburgh. Top Shed always had an allocation of Sir Nigel Gresley's streamlined A4 Pacifics, of which Mallard was the most famous. But at the time of this visit, the Shed also was host to what is today the most famous steam engine in the world, Flying Scotsman. The LNER's first Pacific was still on top link work and had recently been modified with a double blast pipe and chimney. It was later to have German-style smoke deflectors added, which further changed its appearance. Abbotsford was one of the post-war developments of LNER Pacifics, belonging to A.H. Peppercorn's A1 class. The next engine is one of Sir Nigel Gresley's V2-262 class, known as Green Arrows, after the Pioneer engine, which is preserved today. Although classified as mixed traffic, this V2 is painted in the full express passenger lime green livery. Another A4 is number 29 Woodcock, illustrating the immaculate condition of top link locomotives. By contrast, the suburban tank of class N2 is decidedly unkempt. Diesel shunters had already made an impact, as had the short-lived North British Type 1 diesel electrics used on King's Cross suburban services. By contrast, our next shed bash, also in the former London and North Eastern or LNER Railways territory, was to British Railways' latest high-tech shed at Thornaby on Teesside. This shed was located in the very cradle of railways, a little to the east of Stockton-on-Tees, and its principal function was to service the mineral and freight locomotives, which were the mainstay of the industrial North East. Former North Eastern Railway class Q60810 tender engines formed the backbone of Thornaby's fleet. There were 120 engines in this class, the products of Darlington Works from 1913 to 1921. The reason for this visit was to film the brand new facilities which had been installed here in 1959. Even as late as this in the steam locomotive's career, British Railways still needed to invest in new infrastructure. Thornaby was the jewel in the steam railway's crown and was completely constructed in that brave new world's material, reinforced concrete. Overhead water gantries and underlit pits were borrowed from the latest American practice and every effort had been made to make the environment of the shed as clean as possible. A very difficult thing to do in a place as inherently dirty as a steam locomotive shed. <laughs> Such was the regard paid by BR to Railway Roundabout that a locomotive was provided to play to the cameras. Although BR was still building steam engines, just a few Class 9Fs remaining on order, it was to be a mere eight years until all the Q6s had gone and Thornaby was declared redundant, although some of its facilities were adapted for use by diesel. The depot had two power-operated turntables. Traditionally, turntables were hand-operated or utilised the vacuum ejectors of locomotives. The shed itself was of the roundhouse pattern, with another turntable serving radial stabling roads. This shed was to outlast steam, being finally demolished in the 1990s. <laughs> Thank you. 
Our final shed bash in 1959 takes us back to Birmingham, home of Railway Roundabout and of the Midland Railway's Saltley Shed. This was the largest shed in the Birmingham district and was situated a short distance to the east of Birmingham New Street Station, alongside the Midlands' main line to Derby in the north. In 1959, its allocation still included classic Midland designs, such as these 3F and 4F 060s, as well as the most modern motive power. The educational aspect of Railway Roundabout was not overlooked, and this Hughes Crab 260 mogul was used to illustrate the driver's preparation duties. It was essential for a driver to learn and know every type of engine he would be driving, as he had to ensure that every oiling point was attended to, or else trouble would be just around the corner. Another locomotive was picked out at Saltley to illustrate a feature. This is one of British Railway's standard class 5460s, which had been built with Caprotti valve gear. This rotary action valve gear was the final steam locomotive development of any consequence in Great Britain, and might have become the standard form of gear if steam locomotives had had any further developments. The shed had a number of Stanier's three-cylinder 4605X or Jubilee class engines for mainline work to both Derby and Sheffield in the north and Bristol in the south. The shed itself was a double roundhouse and had both freight and passenger locomotives on its allocation. The Midland had a second Birmingham shed at Bourneville on the other side of New Street, which dealt with local passenger duties and freight. The principal LMS design of heavy freight engine was Sir William Stanier's Class 8F, a number of which were shedded here. For the heaviest duties, BR Standard Class 9F spaceships worked from Saltley. This was the third last steam engine to be built at Crew Works, and numerically of the class, although Swindon was to continue to build them throughout 1959 and into 1960. Saltley's allocation worked through to Carlisle on overnight fast freights via Derby and Sheffield. Two earlier members of the class illustrate the only obvious alterations made to the design, the shape of the tender and the fitment of double chimneys to the last built engines. Our final 1959 feature returns us to those glorious summer days of our youth when the sun always shone and carefree holidays were easily available, or so it seems. In rural Devon, on the southern border of Dartmoor, the Great Western's West of England main line spawned a number of branch lines, of which that to Kingsbridge, at the head of the Salcombe River estuary, was perhaps the best known. The branch connected with the main line at Brent and we open with a view of number 5558, which has just come up from the coast with the train and is running round. Our next view is at the second of three intermediate stations on the line at Gara Bridge, where the camping coaches visited in 1958 are seen to the right. This was the only crossing point.
not as well was the station between Gala Bridge and the terminus at Kingsbridge. It also boasted a camping coach in the goods yard. The 573, seen at Kingsbridge, was one of the later series of these 4500 tanks. There were two distinct versions, the earlier ones with flat top side tanks and the later version with sloping tanks, which gave them an increased working range. These tanks could take 1300 gallons, whilst the earlier engines could carry only 1000 gallons. There were a hundred of these later engines which were officially known as the 4575 class, whilst the earlier examples numbered 75 of class 4500. The yellow spot with the letter C on the cab side was the Great Western's route code and power classification system. The colour indicated over which routes the locomotives could work, yellow giving the widest route availability with the exception of uncolored, which could go anywhere. The power classification covered the letters A to E, E being the highest, but this doesn't mean the 4500s were particularly powerful, as the system took into account brake capacity as well as tractive effort. Green lined out livery was an example of BR gilding the lily, as the engines were plain green in GW days. The coaches used on the branch trains were the Great Western's standard B set coaches, two identical vehicles forming a train. Small destination boards can be seen on these above the doors. Back at Gara Bridge, an earlier 4500 tank is on the train, followed by another of the 4575 type. The branch was the first choice of a group of enthusiasts wishing to preserve a West Country branch line when it was threatened with closure in 1963. But sadly, BR removed the track before agreement could be reached and the Dart Valley line was saved instead. Our last shot is back at Brent, where a palm tree sums up the Great Western's image of the English Riviera. The first railway roundabout programme of all appeared on BBC television on the 20th of April 1958. It featured a film recording the closure of a railway, an event that was to become all too familiar in the years to come. The railway which closed at the beginning of 1958 was the former London and North Western Railway and later LMS and Western Region route which served the South Wales coal fields. This was known as the Heads of the Valleys Line as it rang along the north side of the range of mountains which contain the coal on which the prosperity of the region had been built. It ran from Abergavenny, where we see the train being prepared. In Victorian days, the height of private enterprise and business competition, the Norwestern had provided the competition to the various private South Wales railways and the Great Western, which dominated the coastal end of the valleys. This competition resulted in some valleys and coal mines being serviced by three or more different railway companies and, of course, competitive pricing at a time when coal was the principal fuel for British industry. Nationalisation of the railways in 1948 eliminated the competitive element and the new organisation set about the nationalisation of its system, closing duplicate routes throughout the country. This went hand in hand with the scrapping of many historic locomotive types and Pat Whitehouse and John Adams were only just in time to record many of these for posterity. The final train on the Heads of the Valleys line was hauled by the last remaining example of Francis Webb's London and Northwestern Railway coal tank class. 
and one of his Super D 080 heavy freight engines. The train had been organized by the Stevenson Locomotive Society's Midlands Area Branch, which was very active in the 1950s and 60s, ensuring that many branch lines and cross-country lines, such as this, were visited by special trains. It was a time when railways were still the main form of transport for many, but also when enthusiasm for railways was growing, evidenced by the popularity of the railway roundabout programs themselves. The train commemorated not only the closure of the main line, but a number of branches as well. The engines ran down the short branch to Ebber Vale and returned by pushing the train back to the junction at Beaufort. The coal pits were to remain served by the western region. The naming of express trains is a tradition going back to the earliest days of the railways. In the 1950s, the Western Region's principal expresses were the Cornish Riviera Express, serving the West Country, and the Bristolian, serving the Great Western Railway's raison d'etre, Bristol. In 1958, the railway roundabout cameras went to Bristol's Bath Road locomotive depot to see the train being prepared. Ten years after nationalisation, Great Western traditions were still paramount with train reporting numbers on the smoke box door, the coats of arms of the cities served, London and Bristol, on the headboard, and Castle Class 460s powering the train. The driver's name on the cab side was an innovation in 1958, but was only in use for a short time during that year. This film serves to show just how much preparation was needed for a top-link express locomotive in the days of steam. It was the driver's responsibility to ensure that all oil reservoirs were filled, known as oiling round. This also involved going under the locomotive to deal with inside valve gear and cylinders. As befits a prestige train, the engine was one of the latest of its type, a castle class built after the war. It sported a flat-sided tender of the Hawksworth pattern, which was filled with water before moving off to collect its train. This engine, number 7018, the Swilling Castle, was one of the first two to be fitted with a double chimney and exhaust and allocated to the Bristolian. Preparation of the train also involved the guard. At the carriage sidings, we see the guard bring the tail lamp to the back of the train. His next job is to record the carriage numbers and to do the weights, noting the weight of each coach and the makeup of the train. Meanwhile, the yard carriage examiner ensures that the accumulators are full brakes are working, and so on. Inside the train, the restaurant car staff prepares tables for afternoon tea as the train ran after lunch. The guard affixes seat reservations to the seat backs, and most stock being of the compartment type. With the engine coupled on, the guard gives the driver the weights, for example, 10 for 350 means 10 coaches weighing 350 tonnes. The train ran into Bristol Temple Mead station from the southwestern end. The coaches were mostly the most recent British Railway standard type, but painted in the Great Western livery of chocolate and cream, used from 1957 on the western region named expresses only. Headlamps over each buffer indicate an express passenger train, an 82A on the small oval plate on the smoke box, a Bristol Bath Road locomotive. The fire is built up to the firebox door in true Great Western fashion, and the train is ready for a prompt departure.
A special camera mounting was used for shots of the locomotive at work from the cab. This was clamped to the cab side sheets. Inside the train, afternoon tea is served. The dining car was an original Great Western vehicle in this train, and uniformed attendants still gave silver service. The train ran via Filton on the Badmington route through Swindon and Reading to London. It was the only train booked to run at 100 miles an hour in the 1950s, and as such, quite a celebrity. Inside the train, a first-class passenger could relax, whilst the guard, a man at the top of his profession and still sporting the full Great Western gold-braided uniform, checks tickets. In this instance, a young family with second-class tickets, third class was upgraded to second in the late 1950s, were found in a first-class compartment. At speed, there was considerable vibration on the footplate. Filming for this feature took place over five days. On the Friday, line side shots were taken and resulted in this view of a king on the Bristolian. The Great Western's heaviest express engines were used on Fridays when the train weight was increased for the weekend. Inside, the guard makes up his log. All trains were recorded in this way, information on running being compiled from this data together with signalman's logs in the age before computers. Finally, we run into Brunel's great masterpiece Paddington Station, passing pilot engines. From the platform, we see the other double-chimneyed castle, Earl of Mount Edgecombe, arriving with the Crack Express. A good job, well done. Later in the year, John Adams filmed a branch that was the antithesis of the Bristolian, the Cardigan branch in rural southwest Wales. This was a classic small Great Western terminus with a single platform station served by a one-coach train, to which had been added a single box van. Note the various railway staff in their uniforms. Even a small station like this had a station master, a porter, ticket office staff, signalmen, shunters and so on. These handled a train service of four trains a day, taking one hour, 40 minutes to travel 27 and a half miles to the main line junction at Whitlam. On this occasion, this required the use of two of the Great Western standard branch line locomotives, the class 4500 small prairies. Number 4550 is to take the train back along the branch line, while 4558 moves over to the goods yard to take water and to prepare to take the branch freight train out. The driver is given the train's staff token to allow him access onto the single line. The Cardigan branch still had five years to work when these films were taken, closing to passengers in September 1962. However, the original reason for many branch lines was freight traffic, the Cardigan branch starting life as a mineral railway. As can be seen by the length of this pickup goods train, freight was quite substantial until the road lorry, with its inherent flexibility, made heavy inroads.
This had been taking place throughout the 1950s and during the time that Railway Roundabout was on the air from 1958 to 1962, the drift became a flood, destroying the railway's economics. Freight traffic survived a mere eight months after the passenger traffic had gone. Passenger trains were normally handled by the Great Western's last design of light passenger tank engines, the 1600 small panniers, number 1637 being the regular engine at this time. Note the single lamp under the chimney, denoting a local passenger train. The last wagon on the goods train is the guard's van, this being the characteristic Great Western style of van with a single veranda. A short distance along the North Pembrokeshire coast to the west of Cardigan lies Fishguard Harbour, the principal port for sailings to Southern Ireland. The ship arriving is the St David, a 1950s replacement for the original ferry of that name, provided in 1906 when the Great Western Railway formally opened its new extension railway from Clarbeston Road to Fishguard Harbour. This was at the height of ocean-going travel, when transatlantic liner competition was at its most intense and Irish emigration to the United States was at full flow. The new station and port at Fishguard replaced that of Nayland, initially serving the Irish route from the 30th of August 1906. Ships berthed alongside the station, from where boat trains ran to Paddington, and still do today. This is Knowsley Hall, waiting with the stock of the capital's United Express, a portion of which served Fishguard. From 1909, Fishguard became a regular port of call for the Cunard Line, which served Liverpool. Liners such as the Lusitania and Mauritania made their first landfall at the harbour, and fast ocean liner expresses ran direct to London to try to make the fastest run from New York to London. By 1958, Fishguard was serving the Irish traffic with night services to Ross Lair, daily in summer and every two days in winter, and daytime services to Cork and Waterford on alternate days. The Waterford service was to cease the following year. Once again, we see evidence of the railways losing traffic to the roads. The car ferry services had increased during the 1950s, although the days of drive-on, drive-off ferries were yet to come. This Jaguar Mark I is as much a symbol of the 1950s as the container wagon behind it, the first flowering of the railway's bid to cooperate with road transport, which was to develop into the freightliner concept of today. The railway was single track for the first few miles from Fishguard and commenced with a stiff gradient, necessitating banking from the harbour station. It was then double track throughout and maintained as a main line. Local traffic was not significant. Pat Whitehouse took the ferry to Ireland in order to film the activity on August Bank Holiday 1958 at the fair held in the small town of Ballinamore, which was also the principal town served by the Cavan and Leitrim Railway, one of Ireland's famous narrow-gauge network, which had been decimated in the 1950s. The CNL was the last survivor of this network, as its purpose was to transport coal from the mine at Arigna for use in Ireland's coal-fired power stations. It was to survive another two years, closing in 1960. The mine at Arigna was at the end of the Drumshambo branch, which left the main line at Ballinamore, where the railway's works were situated. It had acquired a number of engines from other Irish narrow-gauge lines, numbers three and four coming from the Tralee and Dingle. The engine on the left was an original c and 440 tank. In the station, we see the Arigna branch train, a mixed waiting for the coal train we saw earlier to arrive. This is headed by Tralee and Dingle number 6T, a Hunter 260 tank. This would reverse here to 
go on the CNL main line. The Trillian Dingle had survived until 1953, cattle trains being its last function. These cattle are being loaded into the typical Irish cattle wagons, which had no roofs. Agricultural traffic had already been mainly lost to road transport, but here in Northwest Ireland, the railway still hung on to some of the business. The train was assembled alongside the goods shed with another Trulli locomotive, number 5T, ready to take it up the main line. This engine was a Hunslet 262 tank. The T in the number was to indicate an ex Trulli locomotive. The branch train is held to await a mainline one from Drummond, behind a former Cork, Blackrock and Passage 242 tank. Drummond was on the Sligo to Dublin main line, and the CNL formed a link between that line and the Great Northern's line to Belfast. Once again, the train is a mixed passenger and freight train. Rural Irish communities in the 1950s were very poor and still relied on rail transport, but not for much longer. Pat then went on to Stranralar, the headquarters of the County Donegal Railway. The railway had put on two bank holiday steam specials to Ballyshannon. Normally passengers were carried in diesel rail cars. Here we see one of these being made up at Stranralar by one of the railway's 262 tanks. In this poor country, passengers would feel the loss of their train services. This railway wouldn't see the 1950s out, closing on the 31st of December 1959. The general manager, Barney Curran, never turned a passenger away. One of them was so drunk, Mr. Curran put him in the cab in front of the fire in order to sober him up. is taking the left-hand route to Ballyshannon, straight ahead would take it to Glentys. The line ran over the mountains past Loch Esk to Donegal Town, passing the halt at Loch Esk. This was the Barnsmore Gap, and the weather wasn't very kind. At Donegal Town, the train had to reverse, as the main line ran to Kilbegs, with the Ballyshannon line coming in from the east. The locomotive was serviced here before taking the train bunker first to its destination, where the passengers had a mile-long walk to the sea. Note the special saloon in the background at Ballyshannon. Back at Donegal Town, we see a normal service train arriving, formed of two rail cars plus a steam coach. Normally one rail car would suffice, but this was a bank holiday. The rail cars had to be turned, complete with passengers, as they were single-ended vehicles. The driver's cab was a separate unit, mounted on the four-coupled chassis, but articulated the passenger cabin. Two of these machines survive today, having travelled halfway across the Irish Sea to the Isle of Man, where the splendid Victorian Isle of Man steam railway continues to find a use for them. With both rail cars now turned, an additional coach is added to the train, which sets off over the mountains alongside Donegal Bay. These rail cars were used very much like road buses, with steps down to ground level allowing them to stop anywhere, not just at conventional stations. But even they failed to save the day for the charming Irish narrow gauge. In the days before package holidays and sophisticated tastes for overseas travel, many people had their holidays in the United Kingdom, and the holiday paradise was the West Country, 
billed as the English Riviera by the Great Western Railway. To this end, the railway provided holiday accommodation of its own to supplement the hotels and boarding houses of Torbay, Newquay and St Ives. At a number of small wayside stations, redundant coaching stock was parked in sidings and connected up to local services, the resulting camping coaches providing very cheap holidays at a time when youth groups and schools were first arranging holiday programmes. Many boys were loco spotters and, of course, were the target audience of the railway roundabout programmes. A holiday in a railway carriage was thus something very special, complete with loco spotting. Gara Bridge was an intermediate station on the Kingsbridge Line in South Devon, close to where Pat Whitehouse was enjoying a two-week holiday. He went to the little station on the Saturday to record these scenes of a time and innocence now gone forever. Although the delights of Paynton or Plymouth were easily reached by train, the revellers appear quite happy to besport themselves in the river or the fields beside the station. The coaches themselves were former mainline corridor stock, which were brought to the line at the beginning of each season and returned to Swindon at the end of it for winter maintenance and overhaul. The signal on the right gave access to the camping coach siding. The Midland Railway's main line from Bristol to Birmingham is famous in railway circles for the severe gradient it encounters as it passes over the Licky Hills, just south of the Midland city. The top of the climb is at Blackwell, where we join some loco spotters as they view two British Railway Standard Class 5460s, the second coming up the bank with a Standard Class 9F at the back. The top of the climb is immediately to the south of the platforms, where a Stanier Class 5 shows the extent of its severity. On the back of this train is a Western Region Class 4200 280 tank, number 5226, which dates these sequences after May 1958. The Midland Main Line had been placed in the Western Region after nationalisation in 1948. The Licky Bank starts at Bromsgrove Station and from the platform can be seen the foot of the bank. Banking engines would come down the bank light engine frequently in convoy, especially when the line was busy. They were stabled in sidings to the west of the line. Alongside the big 280 can be seen a Hawksworth pannier tank. These became the standard bankers under the Great Western regime, the 4200 only lasting a short while. Banking engines were classified on a special system based on the power of an LMS Jinty tank, the forebears to the panniers. The 280 was equal one and a half, in other words, equivalent to one and a half Jinties. The panniers were equal one and the BR9F equal two. So the one and a half tank didn't fit neatly into the system. 
The most famous Licky Banker was Big Bertha, a unique Midland Railway 010, which had been scrapped and replaced in 1956 by a BR Standard Class 9F 210. This engine inherited Big Bertha's powerful headlamp for buffering up at night. This train has equals three banking power. The old order is seen here as two of the Jintis are passed by an LMS Class 2P 440 on one of the infrequent local passenger trains calling at Bromsgrove. These varied the pattern by having the bankers buffering up in the platform, as all other trains stopped outside the station. Even a four-coach train needed a banker, as the gradient was 1 in 37.7 for a distance of two miles. Another 2P climbs the bank with a gas wagon at the back. These wagons were used to deliver gas to railway stations before the national distribution system was installed. On the footplate of the banker, we see the procedure at the top of the bank as the train accelerates away from our Jinti. Banking engines didn't couple up for obvious reasons. The signal box gave a panoramic view of trains coming over the summit, and Pat Whitehouse's family enjoyed the sights here, at the station only a few miles from their home in Birmingham. All the railway roundabout programmes were produced at the BBC's Gloucester Green Studio in Birmingham, after editing by Pat and John Adams. Both live nearby, and still do, so they were able to go into the studio to provide the commentary, which was given live after one rehearsal. Any fluffs had to be covered up at the time. We remain at Blackwell inside the signal box to see the procedure for the control of trains on the Licky Incline. The upline from Bromsgrove was provided with an intermediate block signal to allow two trains to climb the bank at the same time. After Blackwell had accepted an up train from Bromsgrove, the train left under the gantry at the south end of the platform and was then under the control of the Blackwell signalman. As the train accelerates up the bank, the Bromsgrove starter returns to danger. In the box at Blackwell, the signalman pulls off to give the train a clear run through the section. The train is first shown as following train in section, as it proceeds up the bank towards the intermediate block signal. The line was fully track circuited and the train's position was shown on the signalling diagram. As soon as the train has passed the intermediate block signal, it shows as leading train in section, and the signalman can return the signal to danger and accept a second train from Bromsgrove. It's interesting to note that both the locomotives seen here are Caprotti valve-geared versions of the familiar Stanier Black Fives. At Blackwell, the indicator shows that the signalman has accepted the second express, and as it runs onto his track circuits, it's shown as following train in section. All this is also displayed on the signalling diagram. The leading train comes past the box as the signalman looks out to ensure that the complete train with its bankers passes his box. When he's satisfied the complete train has passed him, he sets his home signal to danger whilst the second train approaches the intermediate block on the bank. 
This can now be cleared to allow the train to continue its climb as far as the signal box. With the banker cleared out of the way, the road can be set for the second train to proceed without being held up, as the leading train will have accelerated away on the level beyond Blackpool, giving a clear run for the second train. The signal returns to danger, and the bankers can reverse across to the down line to return to Bromsgrove, watched by the signalman. More than one banker at a time can be signalled in this way. The treatment of freight trains on the Licky also merited special attention. This Midland 4F has just come out of the goods loop at Blackpool and is to proceed down the bank. Note the bankers on the down road. In steam days, most freights had at least some of the wagons loose coupled. This meant that the wagons didn't have brakes controlled by the locomotive, only hand brakes on the wagons themselves. However, in many instances, freight trains would have a fitted head. The wagons at the front of the train had been fitted with locomotive controlled brakes. In order to prevent the train from running away down the bank and pushing the locomotive along, it was necessary to apply the brakes before descending. The handbrakes had to be applied by a shunter at the side of the track, using a special pole as the train passed. This practice would certainly fall foul of health and safety at work legislation today. If the train had a fitted head, only every third or fourth loose wagon had to have its brakes applied. If it was fully loose coupled, all wagons had to have their brakes on. The signal goes off again to allow the passage of an up freight. These would usually take their bankers on in the reception sidings on the upside of Bromsgrove. Finally, we see a pair of Jinty bankers returning to their base. Three branch lines were featured in 1958, the second being the Southall branch in rural Nottinghamshire. This ran from Rolston Junction on the Nottingham to Lincoln line. The branch was well known in the late 1950s as it was the last haunt of the classic Midland Railway Johnson 044 tanks, which worked the branch on the push-pull principle. The line had once been part of a through route via Mansfield to Sutton in Ashfield, but the section to the north of Southall had closed as long ago as 1929 although freight continued to run as far as Blidworth via Southall. Southall station was the first on the line, and there were therefore no intermediate stations on the run from Rolston. It was an ornate through station in Midland style, although only one platform was needed. Both the branch and the locomotives were under the threat of extinction, the last of the tanks going in 1960 and the branch closing in 1959. So the railway roundabout team was just in time to show another fast disappearing facet of railway operation. An additional signal on the down platform allowed the train to depart from the arrival platform without crossing over. Back at the junction, the Johnson tank ran forward in order to cross over to the down platform. Note the Midland Railway signal to the left and the standard wooden clad signal box in the background. The third branch was the Hailing Island Line, another with weight restrictions due in this case to the wooden viaduct which crossed the head of Langston Harbour.
This little branch was well known in the 1950s as it was dominated by the famous London, Brighton and South Coast Railway class A1X Terrier tanks, built to the designs of William Stroudley from 1872 to 1880. They provided power for both passenger and freight trains on the branch, although this was one of the few lines in the 1950s where mixed trains with both passenger and freight vehicles in the same train were still permitted. Note in the foreground the small wooden coal stage. The engines were stabled here during the week and worked the four and a half miles run to Havant, a station on the Portsmouth to Guildford and Brighton routes. Many of this famous class lives on in preservation, but not this one. Number 32661 was one of those fitted with a spark arrester on its chimney to work at New Haven Harbour earlier in its career. Rolling stock included both pre-grouping and British Railways coaches. These dwarfed the little engines which were surprisingly powerful for all their diminutive size. In the summer the line boasted a 15 minute frequency but it was closed in 1963. Terriers also featured on a rail tour special in 1958 to the Kent and East Sussex Railway. Here we see the stock being prepared at Robertsbridge, the junction on the Tunbridge to Hastings main line. The leading engine is one of the class to survive today, as it remained in British Railway service until 1963 and is preserved here on the Kent and East Sussex Railway. It was built in 1880 as number 78 Knoll and had spent a part of its life on the Isle of Wight as number W4 Bembridge. This resulted in its extended bunker, a feature of the Isle of Wight engines. The second engine was the Brighton Work Shunter, which was painted in the LBSCR's Stroudly Improved Engine Green and lettered with the work's name. This engine has not survived. The train was organised by the Locomotive Club of Great Britain London branch and came down to Robertsbridge behind one of the morsel rebuilds of Wainwright's class E440s of 1905, number 31019. For certain events, both Pat and John filmed, giving two views of the train arriving. Passengers then transferred to the branch train in time-honoured fashion. By this time, the Kent and East Sussex Railway was only used by freight trains as far as Tenterton and by a summer only hop pickers specials. It was, of course, destined to be preserved, the railway of today recreating the appearance of the rural branch line. The train is seen here at Northiam, the westernmost point of the preserved railway in the early 1990s. Again, two cameras recorded the departure. Stock from all the main constituents of the Southern Railway was employed on the train, very much in the tradition of the Kent and East Sussex. Water was taken at Rolvenden, the headquarters of the railway in its independent days. It was one of the famous Colonel Stevens Light Railways, Colonel Holman F. Stevens, having built up a small empire of impecunious railways throughout the United Kingdom, of which the KESR was the star, 
where he had his office. With the passengers milling about the yard, the train was drawn forward so that the second terrier could take water. This caused a traffic jam on the main A28 road, which was crossed on the level here. The train then climbed Tenterton Bank to the terminus of the line at Tenterton. The railway had previously run beyond here to the main Tonbridge to Ashford line at Headcon. But this section had closed in 1954, the date when regular passenger services were withdrawn. Back at Robertsbridge, the main train was drawn back into the station by the E1. This train was to continue on down the main line to visit Bexhill West and New Haven before returning to London Victoria Station. Top and tail working with terriers was common practice on special trains on the Kent and East Sussex the hop pickers trains also employing this arrangement. As the E1 departs, the narrow coaches can be seen. This was because of tight clearances through the tunnels on the Hastings line. Our final feature in 1958 takes us to the docks again. One of the largest and most famous docks railway systems in the country was that at Southampton, which was owned by the railways. Particularly well known were the southern region's USA class of dock shunting engines, which had been bought as government surplus after the war. Fourteen of these machines roamed the docks throughout the 1950s. There was a tremendous variety of locomotives to be seen on the dock system, which was still working at its peak. One of the southern region's class 5 locomotives is seen bringing an ocean liner express into the docks, passing an ex-London Brighton and South Coast Railway E1060 tank, which is then seen at the watering point alongside a USA and another Brighton tank, a class E2. Mainline engines were serviced at Eastleigh Depot, but the shunters had their own depot within the docks complex. Each locomotive's duties were denoted by a disc with a number on it fitted to the lamp irons. Southampton Docks was very cosmopolitan. No doubt the sailors of this American merchant vessel would have felt very much at home when they saw the switches, or class USA tanks. They'd been brought over to Europe as austerity machines and offered for sale as surplus to requirements after the war. Their very short wheelbase, easy maintenance and comparative power made them ideal dock shunters. This engine was unique, being built by porters, whilst all the others were built by Vulcan. The USAs were supplemented by four of the Brighton class E2 tanks, which had a much longer wheelbase at 16 feet than the Americans at 10 feet. 32109 had arrived in November 1956.
The reason for John Adams' visit to Southampton was to film the radio telephone cab to shore system that was in use to control movements around the docks. This was unique in Great Britain. The locomotives were equipped with whip aerials, radio telephones and turbo generators to provide the required power. The drivers at first objected to their loss of freedom, but were mollified when they realised that they had an efficient form of communication back to base. This meant they could get relief crews or remind control when their shift was at an end. In addition to the transatlantic trade, the Port of Southampton catered for much closer traffic. Channel Islands boats were met by Channel Islands boat trains, which were frequently headed by bullied light Pacifics. And it's number 34063 of the Battle of Britain class that we see partly in warehouse number nine. This engine bore the name 229 Squadron to commemorate the Battle of Britain heroes of the Second World War. Although registered at Liverpool, Cunard's flagship Queen Elizabeth was the most famous ship at Southampton in the 1950s. This magnificent liner, together with her sister ship Queen Mary, ran a weekly service from Southampton to New York in competition with the United States liners. So important was this traffic to the railways, even after the war, that a new ocean terminal had been built specifically to cater for the huge liners. This was considered to be a major project in its day and it had two railway tracks feeding directly into it so that passengers had as little hardship as possible when transferred from ship to train. Special trains were run, usually with headboards. Maunsell's Lord Nelson's monopolised this traffic and his equally famous King Arthur's were also to be seen on this work. The Lord Nelsons were allocated to Eastleigh Depot principally for the boat train work, the named expressers being made up of Pullman stock in the case of the Cunada and United States Lines trains. Also to be seen were trains for Union Castle and many other shipping lines, after which Bullitt's Merchant Navy class locomotives were named. Three double zero seven four was the last of the USA class, but four of them have been preserved. Not so lucky, though, was the docks complex. Today, this area has been turned over to a multi-screen cinema and housing. However, that was in the long distant future. 1959 was just around the corner. The family resemblance between the Jinties and the Midland Railway Class 2F060 freight engines shows the direct lineage that ran through Midland and early LMS design. One of these is seen at Hales Owen, a joint station where a branch from the Midland main line four miles to the north of Blackwall ran to Hales Owen to an end-on junction with the Great Western from Old Hill on the Stourbridge to Smethwick line. The locomotives were shedded at the Midland's Bourneville shed and only these two Fs and smaller one Fs were allowed to work on the line due to weight restrictions imposed by the spindly Dowry Dell viaduct. Midland trains ran no further than Hell's Owen, but Great Western pannier tanks worked through to the Austin works at Longbridge with non-advertised workmen's trains five days a week. This part of the line was jointly owned. Hell's Owen itself was at the foot of steep banks in either direction, and trains had to be banked. This is the cause of the weight restrictions, Dowry Dell Viaduct. The line closed from Hells Owen to the Austin Works at Longbridge as late as 1969, although the workman's train ceased in 1958.
The crossing gates were at Frankley, where the present M6 motorway services are situated. The only crossing point on the line was at Rubri, near which was situated an asylum. The joint section of the line was worked by electric train staff, while the Great Western part was operated by electric train token.